today we are fortunate to have with us Professor Eric Loeb. Uh, Eric is an assistant professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at uh, Florida International University in Miami. And I've been trying to find a way to bring him here for a while. And uh, it's good, good timing because his, his book is, is coming out uh, in short order. Uh, Eric completed his PhD in Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University in 2013. Uh, he also has uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Pennsylvania and the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he also has a postdoc, he completed a postdoc at the Crown Center in Middle, in, uh, at uh, Brandeis University in their uh, Crown Center for Middle East Studies. Uh, Dr. Loeb's research focuses on the intersection of development and politics in the Middle East with a special focus on uh, how state and non-state actors instrumentalize development as soft power uh, in order to further their political interests, both domestically and internationally, and he'll certainly talk about that today. Uh, I should say that his dissertation in 2013 was awarded the best dissertation prize uh, by the Foundation for Iranian Studies. Uh, and it's that dissertation that has now been revised and is about to be published uh, as a book uh, by Cambridge University Press, and he told me it's supposed to be published in December, so literally just in time for uh, holiday season. Uh, and the title of the book is Iran's Reconstruction Jihad, Rural Development and Regime Consolidation After 1979. Right? Uh, and his talk today is in some ways related to his, his book, but also a preview of maybe some of his research that he's completed uh, since the book. Uh, and judging from the title, uh, I think it's going to be really fascinating and is also very timely. So please join me in welcoming uh, Eric Loeb to the University of Oklahoma. Thank you, Professor Marashi, for having me and to, uh, also to the Farzane Center for inviting me and to all of you for, for coming to this talk on a cold day, particularly for me coming from Miami. Um, <laughs> So anyway, uh, as, the, as indicated in the title, I'm going to be talking about uh, Iranian de uh, reconstruction development and aid in Syria during the uh, Syrian civil war that's been going on for the last eight years, a, a devastating conflict that uh, has yet to end. And um, this does relate to my book project, um, which will be coming out hopefully at the end of the year on looking at Iran's Reconstruction and Development Organization, the logo of which is displayed here next to Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, in Persian, it's jihad sazendigi which means reconstruction or construction jihad. Uh, you can see there's some Quranic verse, and this is the logo um, with uh, uh, some uh, uh, vegetation there on the right and uh, a wreath, essentially, and uh, a sickle there. Um, and the, this, the organization's uh, logo, which is Hame Baham, all together to inspire unity within the organization. The organization was created in 1979, uh, just several months after the Revolutionary Guard, which is of, often talked about, the IRGC, uh, Iran's parallel security institution. This was created as a parallel rural development institution in parallel to the Ministry of Agriculture and other ministries and agencies and the bureaucracy. At the time of the Iranian Revolution in 1979, over half of the population still lived in rural areas. So uh, while development itself uh, was, was a policy goal of the new revolutionary state, there was also a political angle to the organization in terms of sending young uh, men and women out to the villages and provinces to win hearts and minds and marginalize opponents. Because in, the, in 1979 through the 1980s, Khomeini and his circle of clerics and followers in the Islamic Republican Party, Party, the IRP, faced opponents in urban areas and also rural areas. So this organization was a soft power mechanism to help the state con uh, consolidate power during those early contentious years of the revolution. In 1983, the organization will become officially a government ministry, be converted from a revolutionary organization to a government ministry, which never happened with the IRGC, or it did, it momentarily happened, but then it, be it became separate again from the bureaucracy. And then the organization started doing development activities overseas. So one of the first countries it went to was, not surprisingly, Lebanon, where it worked with Hezbollah on uh, creating a, a branch of the organization in Arabic called Jihad al-Bana, which is construction jihad in Arabic, to help Hezbollah uh, socialize 
and service its constituents in Lebanon Shia territories in the Bekaa in the south, in uh, Dahye, the southern Lebanon, the so southern Lebanon, or I'm sorry, southern Beirut suburbs. Um, and then also, interestingly, the organization, I talk about this in the book, went to Africa to help Iran, which was internationally isolated, facing economic sanctions, uh, reach out to African nations through development, through this organization and ministry, and create political, diplomatic, economic, and commercial relations with Africa. So basically the book talks about all of that, the, the evolution, development and evolution of the organization from the Islamic Revolution until the present day, looking at its activities in Iran, Lebanon, Africa. And so the book was done and I thought, okay, I'm gonna take a break from this organization, but then I start seeing that this organization is not surprisingly active in the current conflict zones of the Middle East. So the organization has a presence in Syria, it has a presence in Iraq. It has a presence, uh, according to <coughs> official statements, in Yemen, um, which is perhaps a little more opaque um, with the Houthis. But I started researching the organization from afar. I should say for the book, I actually got to go to Iran. I was very fortunate. I did interviews. I did uh, research at libraries and archives on the organization. But I started having problems at the end. This was between 2009 2011. And even though I've been invited back, I haven't gone back to Iran and, and taken the, those, those risks. Hopefully the situation will, will improve and researchers such as yourselves and scholars can go back and perform substantive research. So for this research, a, a new project, although it, it kind of uh, you know, is a continuation of my research, um, I'm looking at the organization uh, in Syria and what it's been doing there and kind of you know, the soft power arm of the Islamic Republic in, in Syria. Uh, yes, I have to point this way. So if we go quickly to the timeline, for those of you who are not familiar with this conflict, we have the civil war that began as a peaceful popular uprising and then evolved into a civil war in 2011. We have Iran intervening militarily in 2012, uh, the IRGC sending its, its Quds force there. It's uh, the IRGC's entity that operates overseas. Uh, found its way into Syria to give military support to the state, to the Syrian state, along with Hezbollah uh, from Lebanon, which again has a close relationship to Iran and Syria. And uh, the Iran, uh, the IRGC Quds Force helped form local militias in Syria and even brought fighters uh, from, from different parts of the region, uh, Shia fighters from Iraq and elsewhere, Afghanistan, uh, to form the National Defense Forces. In 2014, 2015, the conflict really peaks. We, we see the rise of, of ISIL or ISIS and other, um, I mean, even before that, of course, there were rebel groups, but this is really the heyday when, uh, of, of you know, more extremist groups like ISIL that begin to seize territory, make territorial gains in the conflict. There's also a, uh, an alliance between Turkey and Gulf Arab states to counter uh, the Syrian government and to support rebel groups and, and, and even extremist groups against the Syrian state and its allies. In 2015, Russia intervenes and it really kind of helps tilt the conflict uh, in favor of the, uh, of the Syrian state and Iran and other allies. And in, and in 2015 as well, we have um, the construction jihad, jihad is Zendigi, um, which also goes by the name of the construction mobilization, and I'll get into that, Basijis Sazendigi, open up its first offices publicly inside of Syria and undertake reconstruction projects, development services, and humanitarian aid. And so, you know, here's a sign of one of their offices. Um, in Arabic, of course, they're going to be, because they're operating in a Syrian context, you're going to see a lot of their uh, offices and, and posters and banners in Arabic as opposed to Persian. Um, but, you know, here it says Jihad al-Bana in Arabic, Munazamat Jihad al-Bana, Mila Jumhuriya al-Islamiya al-Iraniya, Turahib Bikum, we welcome you. So uh, this is, you know, one of their uh, office, uh, this is one of the signs outside of their offices uh, inside of Syria. Now, the, organi the organizational landscape is a bit complex, and I'll, I'll just kind of give you an overview, and we can get into more details later. But as I said, Construction Jihad was established in 1979 in Iran. Um, I went over a little bit of the history in my introduction. 
Um, it started out as a popular movement and a revolutionary organization, and then between 1983 to 2001, it becomes a government ministry. It actually, since 2001, has ceased to exist as an independent entity because it merged with its longtime uh, competitor, the Ministry of Agriculture, to form the Ministry of Agricultural Jihad, um, Jihad de Keshavarzi. So if you actually want to talk to former ministry, uh, members of the organization, a lot of them are today inside this ministry and have different opinions about, about that. Uh, and that's where I conducted a lot of my interviews. They have different buildings around Tehran and around Iran. Um, so as Construction Jihad was becoming a ministry in 1983, the Islamic Repo Republic formed a different or established a different development organization at the same time because um, construction of jihad was becoming very bureaucratized. And um, while that was happening, while it was be being reconstituted as a ministry, it was less active in the rural areas. Uh, it was going through a transition period. So they established a separate organization called Construction Mobilization, the Sijis Sazendigi in 1983 the very year that Construction Jihad became a ministry. And in 2000, and this organization did very similar things. It, it, again, it was a, a non, I mean, it was a governmental organization, but a non-bureaucratic organization going to the provinces and villages of Iran, de delivering goods and services to rural areas, um, you know, operating independently outside of the bureaucracy. And in 2000, when there's, a, there's heightened factionalism, between the reformists and the conservatives. The conservative faction of Iran, the supreme leader Khamenei, um, you know, the successor to, to uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, securitizes this organization and integrates it more closely with the IRGC and the Basij, which is Iran's paramilitary force. And the organization increasingly becomes a branch or almost an arm of the IRGC and the Basij. And in 2015, the construction mobilization deploys to Syria as, a, like I said, a branch or an arm of the IRGC's Quds Force. Um, so if you could follow all of this, because there's a, always a lot of institutions in Iran when you really unpack the, the state and open up the black box, um, this, you know, this is what is entering Iran, not construction jihad, which is a ministry and is merged with the Ministry of Agriculture, but construction mobilization is the organization that's sent into uh, to Syria with the IRGC's Quds Force and calls itself Construction Jihad in Arabic, Jihad al-Bana. Were you all able to follow that? Okay. It's, it gets confusing. <laughs> now, to add even more uh, uh, complexity to this story, the Lebanese branch uh, that's affiliated with Hezbollah also goes into Syria, um, and that's called Jihad al-Bana as well. So you have uh, an Iran-affiliated construction jihad that's affiliated with the uh, IRGC in Syria that, that I'm going to primarily be looking at today, but also Hezbollah's uh, construction jihad that was established in 1988 with help of Iran is also in there helping the Syrian state. Okay, so we, when, you know, when you look at this, you have to differentiate. Is this the Iran uh, construction jihad or construction mobilization that's operating, or is this the work of Leb Leb uh, Lebanon and, and Hezbollah's construction jihad? which I won't focus on as much today. But here are some of the, they, they've been focused on working with the Syrian Ministry of Agriculture on, um, on joint initiatives involving agriculture, forestry, fishery, and public works. And that, you know, that's, that's about all I'll, I'll say about them today. Now, in terms of the research question that's driving this research are, what are the geopolitical, strategic, and ideational interests that are behind this project? that are driving it. Um, what are the merits and shortcomings of uh, construction jihad's reconstruction development and aid model inside of Syria? How is this, how are these development activities, reconstruction and aid activities countering violence inside of Syria, but perhaps also exacerbating it? Whether, you know, even as an unintended consequence of these policies. And then because we're dealing with such a complex landscape of international, regional, and local actors. My paper gets into the linkages and dynamics because Iran is not just operating in a vacuum. Construction Jihad is not op just operating in a vacuum inside of Syria. You've got you know, Iranian institutions that are there, Russia, Hezbollah, 
Hezbollah is there militarily, as I've discussed, but they're also there with their reconstruction and development organization. You have Shia militias, um, and you have the Syrian government and its population. And you have to take all these levels of analysis into account when you're, when you're looking at the organization and, the, and how it's operating inside of the country. So how, how are all these different linkages and dynamics impacting the conflict and the wartime reconstruction? So um, I, I know there's a lot of text up here, but in terms of geopolitical interests, objectives, you see a lot of the same things that are at work that the organization was involved in in Iran, in Lebanon, uh, less so in Africa, but in, in Syria as well. In terms of um, you know, helping Iran control, and, and the Syrian government, of course, and its allies, control and take credit for the reconstruction process in Syria. Now, Russia is also playing a big role in that as well. And there's co co uh, co cooperation and competition between Russia and Iran and Syria over reconstruction portfolios. Um, there's also social and demographic engineering at place uh, here. So you see the same thing with Hezbollah after the war between Israel and Hezbollah in 2006, where reconstruction, development, and aid is not just going equally across the population. It's going to real and perceived loyalists of, the, uh, of Hezbollah in Lebanon and then in Syria, people that are seen to be on the side of the government. And particularly, uh, not just supporters of the government, but more tangibly, people who are fighting on the side of the forces that I, that I showed you before, who are fighting on the side of the Syrian government, on, e on the side of Iran, on the side of Hezbollah, uh, the national defense forces that I described. Um, so, you know, there's an effort to create uh, popular legitimacy, pa uh, political support, patronage networks, patron-client relations on the ground through distributing public goods and social services, um, trying when, when territory is, is consolidated, uh, particularly during 2016 and afterwards, when really the tide of the conflict shifts in favor of the Syrian government and its allies, to use uh, reconstruction, development, and aid to con try to consolidate uh, control over these territories, um, as was done in Iran uh, after the revolution, and trying to achieve, although it may not be achievable, spatial hegemony and reducing spaces of contestation inside the country. Um, so in terms of my arguments, um, I, what I'm seeing from the data, but again, this is new research and I'm still fleshing it out, is that it, 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 it appears that this is working to, these projects are working to mitigate violence. Um, that they're you know, appeasing segments of the Syrian population um, and, and helping uh, Iran and its allies that are fighting, and I'll, and I'll show you the specific territories, consolidate territory against rebels and extremists after 2016. Now, on the other hand, and, and perhaps as a long-term consequence, the exclusivity of these projects, so in other words, you know, the fact that these projects favor real and perceived loyalists of the Syrian government and Iran and its allies may actually exacerbate conflict. And, I, you know, we have to see how we can empirically look at this over time. Um, because it's going to, you know, it's going to create winners and losers on the ground. Um, and so, you know, the, the recipients and beneficiaries of, of these projects and services and aid, um, of course, are going to benefit, and I'll get more into the details of how they're benefiting. But the people who are excluded from these projects and services, um, you know, even if, they're, if they were people who were citizens who remain neutral to the extent that they could during the conflict, it's going to create grievances moving forward by excluding them. Uh, from these from these processes and these projects and services. So in terms of the significance of the project, I mean, obviously we're looking in the area of Middle East politics, IR security, conflict studies. Just like what I noticed in the literature on revolutionary and post-revolutionary Iran, the emphasis is primarily when you look at Iran's involvement in Syria on coercive institutions uh, and military institutions and, and, and economic support as well. Um, but there's very little emphasis, again, on Iran's role in reconstruction, development, uh, humanitarian aid, looking at uh, construction jihad and construction mobilization as an institution that delivers in those areas. Um, and um, also in terms of thinking about how, like I, I just discussed, how these project services and aid can either mitigate violence but also contribute, uh, contribute to it moving forward. And and the contextual factors and transnational linkages that I described in terms of the different levels of analysis that we have to look at. 
Now, in terms of the results of the research, when you look at where, um, beginning in 2015 and onwards, where the organization was operating, and where at least public, publicly was or publicizing its activities, you see that it was in areas of major geostrategic importance and, um, and areas where there was intense and heavy fighting and damage and destruction. Okay, so I, I drew circles, if you could see them, I mean, they're in blue, but in terms of the areas where the organization has predominantly been operating, of course, in and around the capital of Damascus, and particularly Huta and eastern Huta, which has been a really a, an area that was highly contested between the Syrian military and its allies and rebels and extremist forces, um, to the north in Aleppo, which, uh, of course, even after 2016, when the rebels uh, and you know, extremists were defeated by, um, by the Syrian forces and its allies, there's much destruct damage and destruction there. There's still some pockets of resistance. And this also applies here to the eastern part of the country in Deir ez-Zor, um, al Mayadin, and Abu Kamal, that's close to the Syria-Iraq border. Um, and, of course, um, Iran and its allies and Shia militias were fighting ISIS and, and other uh, groups in uh, western Iraq. So this, you know, controlling this border area is very important from a geostrategic standpoint. Um, so again, you know, these are the major points, and you, you see similar projects that are being, that are being uh, done by the organization, reconstruction projects, food distribution, educational assistance, um, literally deploying humanitarian aid convoys to, de uh, to deliver these, building hospitals and factories, um, electrification and power plants, very similar projects that were done uh, on the ground inside of Iran after the revolution and in Lebanon with Hezbollah in, uh, in Lebanon and, and even in Africa to an extent. Um, this is just a sign of one of the power plants that it was building um, around Aleppo, Aleppo in, in Nubal and, and, and Zahra. Um, again, uh, very similar services and activities uh, in Deir Azor and around in Mayadeen and uh, in Abu Kamal. Uh, you know, I won't list them all. In terms of the primary beneficiaries, as I said, this is a, an exclusive, uh, even though they say publicly that all residents of these cities and these governance um, and, and, and uh, townships will all be receiving aid and, and, and reconstruction projects and social services, they're very targeted to uh, the members, martyrs, families, and supporters of pro-government forces. Uh, they're really the primary beneficiaries. And, um, and you see this uh, as well in, in, um, in, in Lebanon uh, with Hezbollah in terms of how this works. And so, you know, again, the question comes up is, is uh, you know, while this may help pro-government forces consolidate territory in the short run, uh, the question is, is w by excluding other uh, people from the process or residents or Syrians, uh, will it aggravate conflict in the long term? Is it, you know, it's just a question. Here's one of the hospitals um, in Aleppo that uh, Construction Jihad built. For the, for the wounded uh, that fought in the National Defense Forces. You can see a wounded soldier here um, and, and the sign that says our wounded, our, our pride and our glory, um, Fakharna wa Azna. Um, now, in terms of the framing of how these services are packaged and how they're delivered to um, these pro-government forces <laughs> and you know, even to the wider population at times, it's very interesting to look at how they're framed. Um, you know, and, and, and how they're packaged um, by, by the organization. And it actually coincides with a lot of past framing that the organization has done and that Iran has done in general, I mean, that Hezbollah has done inside of Lebanon. So um, when, when they're delivering um, speeches and making statements and, and interviews and, and media, and, you know, they like to make, when, like, for example, when they opened that hospital I showed you, they had a big opening ceremony for it, and the, jihad, the construction jihad representative was there making statements in front of um, soldiers of the Syrian army and the wounded that you saw. And so, you know, I was analyzing some of those speeches, and they have videos of them. So, you know, even though I can't conduct interviews, you can go on social media and see what they're saying. But, you know, they're, when, they, when they talk about the pro-government forces and militias, they're, they're always talking about them in terms of national defense and counterterrorism in a way to legitimate them and to justify their mission and their actions. And, you know, this, this concept of defense 
Defa is, is present in um, a lot of the framing that you see in Iran. So during the Iran-Iraq war, and even now, they, they called that the, the holy or sacred defense, the imposed war, you know, it, it was a defensive endeavor, even though Iran, you know, several years later takes it, goes on the offensive inside of Iraq, but that's a minor detail. Um, the, the, you know, the uh, Hezbollah calling itself the Islamic resistance, so against this concept of defense and the axis of resistance, the alliance between Hezbollah, Iran, and Syria. And of course, you know, the goal is to boost morale, to strengthen cohesion, to legitimate or validate uh, their mission and actions, and also to compensate. You know, the reason why they're really focused on the pro-government forces is to, to compensate them for their fighting, uh, to offer them health care and, and, and other services, um, to, you know, to reward them really for their, for their efforts and for sacrificing their lives. There's also, when you look at uh, the organization and the goods and services and activities that they've done, they're, they're really emphasis, and you see it in the flyer that was circulated, on Iranian-Syrian unity and also on Muslim solidarity. So um, you don't really, you know, there's not much talk of, of Shiism, uh, even though, you know, Iran is a 12-er Shia country and Syria is an Alawite state, but, you know, they're really emphasizing on bringing to Muslims together, um, kind of in a pan-Islamic uh, framework. And again, we see these messages of, of unity, as I showed you at the beginning of my talk, that exist from the very beginning of the organization. You know, we're all working together towards construction. Hezbollah has a very similar slogan, Construction Jihad says, together we resist, together we build. Um, again, you know, for purposes of legitimacy, for political support, but also to marginalize opponents, you know, in terms of defining who the insiders are and, and who the outsiders are. Um, in, time, in terms of trying to create zones of influence and sympathizers in and around government strongholds. And again, using the same, uh, and I'll show you more concrete examples, uh, same means to deliver these messages through speeches, statements, interviews, and, and even using their own media and propaganda to do so. And I'll show you um, some examples. I have some statements here that they give, uh, for example, as I said, at the opening ceremony at the hospital that it built in Aleppo. Um, again, framing things as, as local defense and counterterrorism um, and unity between Iran and the Syrian people. Um, you know, gifting humanitarian aid, reconstruction and development uh, from the Iranian nation to the city of Aleppo. These are just some examples. And also using, uh, we see this from the very beginning of the organization, using Quranic verse and hadith to transmit these messages as well in a pious way. So, and I'll show you an example, uh, I'll, I'll show you an image of this, but the, one of the humanitarian aid convoys, actually several of them, both in Aleppo and in and around Deir Azor, um, have these, uh, these Quranic verse and hadith on the banners and on the posters of the trucks that are, and the convoys that are delivering this aid. Particularly this one, the Prophet, peace, upon, peace be upon him, said, whoever does not care about Muslim matters is not a Muslim. Again, trying to promote Muslim unity and saying that Muslims have a responsibility to help each other, particularly in times of need and times of crises. And this is not just to gain uh, legitimacy and support inside of Syria, but also to try to delegitimate complaints that are coming out of Iran and elsewhere. They're saying, well, why is the, they're questioning the Iranian government for helping Syria in, in a time where Iran is experiencing its own economic adversity. And I'll, and, and I'll get to that. Um, also, you know, even the, the mineral uh, water bottles that they're, that they're uh, distributing have Iranian and Syrian flags on the labels in the factories that they're, uh, uh, you know, th that are coming from the factories that they're producing these mineral bottles and then distributing to the population. So you see similar framing devices. Oops. So this is just one example. Again, the, 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 you can't really see it as clearly, but that's the Hadith verse that I was... Uh, describing in terms of Muslims helping each other, that if you're not helping a, a, a Muslim, then you yourself are not a Muslim. And then help from Musa'adat uh, al-Jumhuri al-Islamiyya al-Iraniyya al al-Shaab al-Suri, help from the Islamic Republic of Iran to the Syrian people. Again, emphasizing, and even, even though, of course, it's not just going widespread to all the Syrian people, it's being primarily being sent to specific beneficiaries. Um, so, you know, here's just more examples. It's, it's um, you know, again, the same slogans, a lot of the same stuff in, in the different locations that I was describing. Here we have here um, these individuals who are 
driving the convoy who were waving and, and they have it even on the trucks the Iranian and Syrian flag again to try to promote that that unity um, between you know the pro-government forces and the local populations anyway there, there's a, there's a lot of examples here uh, I won't belabor them though one of the interesting things, though, as I said, is when you look, when you go on social media, you actually see backlash. Um, you know, despite this effort to frame this as promoting Iranian-Syrian unity um, to try to legitimate the cause, it, it, they can't prevent the backlash. Um, and so there's reports of, um, of Syrian residents who, of course, accept the humanitarian aid and reconstruction development from the organization, but also highly suspicious about it. And some of them are even afraid to speak out about it, you know, that understanding that these, this is not just, um, you know, some innocuous aid and, uh, and reconstruction, but it has a political mission um, to support the state. And so, you know, there, there is suspicion and there is wariness, reports of that among Syrian residents, some Syrian residents in, in these territories. The other thing is, as I said, is that there's Iranian activists and citizens who have gone on social media and called out the organization and said, you know, why are you helping the Syrians when we had just had a devastating earthquake in 2017 in Kerman Shah? And when now, since 2018, we, you know, the U.S. has withdrawn from the nuclear deal and we are facing devastating sanctions. What are you doing in Syria, you know, distributing all of this assistance when we need your assistance back here in Iran? And so they even called out the Iranian Red Crescent and said, you know, we noticed that you were with uh, Construction Jihad in Aleppo, in Deir ez and elsewhere as part of this. Where, where, where are you in the Kerman Shah earthquake? Where are you now, uh, you know, again, when we're facing economic adversity? And interestingly, on its Twitter page, the Iranian Red Crescent denied that it was in Syria. It said, no, 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 this, this was the work of other institutions. And yet, clearly... <laughs> You see pictures here of boxes with the label of the Iranian Red Crescent. I think this was either in Aleppo or Deir Azor. Now the question is, is, is the Iranian Red Crescent working alongside construction jihad and construction mobilization and the IRGC in Syrian uh, cities and towns? Or it was just this a cover? Did they just slap these labels on to legitimate the organization and say, you know, we're representing the Iranian Red Crescent? So. You know, that, that's a question that, that I haven't uh, answered yet um, in terms of which way this is, this is working. So another interesting thing that's happening, um, and again, I'm trying to substantiate this, you know, is it allegation, is it reality, um, is that there's, there's claims that the organization has been expropriating and redistributing property, real estate, housing, and land. Uh, to, uh, you know, purchasing it from, because laws have been passed in Syria during the conflict that have basically stripped people. There's a number of decrees and laws that have been passed, you know, since the conflict began that basically say that if you are a delinquent owner, in other words, if you are an owner of property and you don't have the means to pay your mortgage anymore, then your property becomes the state's property. If you are an IDP, an internally displaced person, if you're a refugee, then, and you're no longer in your home, then your home can be uh, expropriated by the state. And so, you know, there's a whole, uh, someone wrote an article about the, the legal architecture behind all of this that the Syrian government has pursued uh, to, make these, these, to make this happen. But there's also rumors that the organization itself has gotten involved in these transactions and has uh, purpose, uh, purchased delinquent property or property where the owners are no longer there, the occupants are no, no longer there, and have either, again, you know, seen this as an investment and compensation for its support of the government, the Syrian government, or and or have redistributed this property to fighters, pro-government forces. So this is what I'm talking about. Uh, and again, we need to, I need to investigate, you know, how, um, you know, credible this is. Um, but I've seen it, uh, I've seen a lot of reports about this. I mean, of course, a lot of it is criticism from the uh, anti-government side. Um, but you know, this kind of gets into the question that I or the issue that I discussed about social and demographic engineering um, in terms of resettling uh, pro-government forces, uh, members of the national defense forces and other militias um, in in the homes of of people again who are either delinquent or have abandoned their homes, you know, out of necessity during the conflict. 
Um, and so again, I put a question here, the veracity of these acquisitions and holdings. Um, and you know, if it is true, well, then it's part of an effort uh, along with all these other activities and, and a rational effort. I'm not necessarily criticizing it to consolidate territory and to consolidate a social base in, in areas where the government has been able and, and government forces and, their, and its allies have been able to reclaim territory in and around Damascus, Aleppo, Deir Ezzor, and elsewhere. And you see similar strategies being done by Hezbollah in Lebanon after the 2006 war with Israel. Now, the thing is, is that you can question the veracity of this, or if it really is taking place, most likely, because these laws specify that if, if uh, property is being expropriated, if it is being redistributed, it has to be done by local intermediaries, public-private uh, partnerships. So. Dur during this time, you see re uh, Syrian real estate firms uh, that are developed, where the idea is for uh, private uh, investors in Syria to gain access, you know, to basically expropriate these properties and, and eventually make a profit, but at the same time have a state uh, agent involved so that the state does not lose entirely control of property, land, real estate, etc. So this was, you know part of, uh, in 2015, law number 19, where these local public-private partnerships are created. And if, if construction jihad is expropriating and distributing land, it is mo most likely doing so through these Syrian intermediaries. As well as when it distributes aid, a lot, of the, uh, a lot, if not all of the time, has to go through Syrian intermediaries as well. Because what's interesting here is that the Syrian government is doing whatever it can, even with its own allies, to maintain sovereignty over what's happening uh, during the reconstruction phase. Um, and not just allowing you know, Iran or Russia to, uh, to do what, what it wants carte blanche. It always wants to be involved um, in, in, in the reconstruction activities to the extent that it can, even if it has limited leverage, even if it depended on Iran and, and Russia for its survival, even if it has limited capital or funds to contribute uh, to real estate transactions, to a reconstruction project, it, you, you see itself continually trying to insert itself into these processes so that it doesn't lose sovereignty. And you see that as well in the rhetoric and discourse of Iranian Russian inf officials who constantly say, as opposed to the United States, we're here because the Syrian government invited us to be here. And if, if tomorrow it says it no longer wants us, then you know, we'll happily leave. Although, you know, again, is that, is that just you know, rhetoric and discourse? But nonetheless, someone wrote an article about this, about how the sovereignty narrative is so important um, during this conflict for um, Syria and, and Iran and its allies to, to acknowledge repeatedly Syrian sovereignty. You see over time, though, that, um, that the Syrian government, and I won't get into details because I want to wrap up and take your questions and comments, has given concessions uh, for the military and economic support that it's received from Iran and Russia um, in the form of contracts and agreements in, in lots of different industries. Um, in the case of Iran, you see it done in the agriculture sector, telecommunications, infrastructure, finance, and housing. What's interesting, though, is that, you know, these agreements have very large numbers attached to them, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, for example, for a, a mobile phone license and others. But very few of them have actually been, or maybe not very few, but less of them have actually been implemented. So a lot of them are still in writing, right? And again, I think this gets back to questions of, of, of sovereignty and flexibility and maneuverability that the Syrian government is trying to maintain vis-a-vis -vis its allies. Um, so, and, and, and as I said, even, um, even in the case of humanitarian aid, the Syrian government, and, and you see this with construction jihad and construction mobilization, the Syrian government invokes UN General Assembly Resolution 46-182 uh, to, to, again, say that if, if you are a humanitarian organization, even coming from our allies, then you must go through Syrian intermediaries uh, to distribute that aid. And so you see construction jihad and construction mobilization working with Syrian intermediaries um, to do that. Okay, and so again, that's part of, that's the way that the, uh, the organization um, appeases the Syrian government and yet still involves itself in, in the reconstruction process. So I'll get to the conclusions again. Um, we'll, um, I'll take, I want to take you know, as many questions and comments as possible. 
Um, since 2016, the organization has been uh, publicly, at least, present and active in territories with geostrategic importance, prolonged conflict, and extensive damage and destruction. Primary beneficiaries, again, have been uh, pro-government uh, forces, fighters, families, martyrs, orphans, widows of those forces. The framing has emphasized defense and counterterrorism, uh, Syrian-Iranian unity, Muslim solidarity, uh, but that hasn't insulated the Iranian um, government or the Syrian government and others from public backlash, both inside of Syria and Iran and elsewhere among Syrian and Iranian activists and citizens. Of course, this becomes very politicized. Uh, there, there's reports about property expropriation and redistribution um, that are facilitated by Syrian legislation and government in intermediaries. But at the same time, you know, we have to view those reports with skepticism, again, because of the Syrian government's efforts to maximize its uh, sovereignty and, and maneuverability and flexibility inside the country, even vis-a-vis -vis its allies. You know, really, the long-term vision is that Syria will ultimately, when this conflict ends, whenever it will end, be in control or as much in control as possible of, of assets on the ground inside the country. And then the question is, is because the organization, Construction Jihad, construction mobilization and other Iranian institutions, because the reconstruction development and aid model is exclusive, as we see in Lebanon, as we see in Iran, and, and perhaps even in the context of other countries that get involved in these activities. Perhaps the U.S. operates this, well as well, this way as well. Um, but because, you know, the model is, is, tends to be exclusive, tends to be distributive, uh, tends to be politicized, then, you know, again, in the short term, the model may help uh, promote territorial consolidation, but we have to keep an eye on whether or not, you know, to what extent, based on the winners and losers it creates on the ground, will it, will it mitigate or will it prolong conflict in the long term? So I'll just end it there and, and I'll take your questions and comments. Thanks.